picture of what was the front cover of a journal that we used all week on our mission trip. And the theme was soul stories, the bottoms of your feet. So I want you just for a second to, before I read the scriptures, to try to feel the bottoms of your feet, right? Not with your hands, like, <laughs> well, you can. <laughs> just note, notice the bottoms of your feet, right? And think about, even in the last 24 hours, where your souls have been. Right? And maybe in the last week, where your souls have been. Or the last month. Or the last year. And all the places that our souls go, right? Our hearts go there, our minds go there, our friends go there with us and our souls, right? That our souls actually have a lot of stories to tell. Um, some outside stories, stuff we do, things we experience, and a lot of in inside stories too, of how those things that we experience and the things we do change who we are and uh, grow us in our relationship with God um, and mature us as people. And so our theme verse for our mission trip was found in Isaiah 52. We, our theme verse itself was the last verse, 7, but I'm going to read the first seven verses of chapter 52. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised or the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise, O captive Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at the first, at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now therefore, what have I here, says the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing? Their rulers wail, says the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who pronounce peace, who bring good tidings of salvation, who publicize salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite any of the kids who want to come forward and want to be closer sit up here, and the younger kids, if you want to head to the nursery, that's fine too. So we're going to tell you about the mission trip that we just had to Maine, and we're going to do it in a kind of round-robin way, each of us taking a different part. And so for starters, um, I'll just have you share it where you are, but I want you to share, if you want on the mission trip, a word or two that summarizes your experience of your trip to Maine. So, yeah. Um, I said humbling. You gotta stand up and turn around, at least. Uh, my word was humbling. Um, rewarding. Spiritual. I put fulfilling and fun. <laughs> Enriched. Spiritual, emotional, physically exhausting. <laughs> Inspired. That's the last time you're going to hear without a microphone, okay? <laughs> because you need to hear that. But there, we, it was a lot. There was a lot of things to uh, to experience over the trip. So I'm going to invite Barla forward, and she's going to tell us um, some things about what she was thankful for on the trip. Barlow's a friend of Jenna's from school. Jenna invites her friends. Fascinating. You all can invite your friends to church and things, too. <laughs> we'll use Jenna as a great example because we love Barlow. She's like, just part of us now. <laughs> um, so on this trip, I was thankful to, we went to Portland, Maine. So I was thankful to the Portland community because they really just opened our arms and welcomed us so easily. Um, I was also thankful for the inspiring leaders that we met, who we will hear about later, who really stepped up in their community to make an important difference and provided with us the programs that allowed us to do our part. And then finally, I was thankful for the amazing group of women who the experience would not be the same without. And Barla was wearing a t-shirt from The Root Cellar, which we'll hear more about that organization later. I'm going to write Jenna. 
she's going to tell you a little bit about the positive part of the mission trip for her. Um, one of the positive experiences of mine on this mission trip was getting a chance to connect with the people in Portland, Maine. Um, on Tuesday night, we were fortunate enough to participate in a unique program called Neighbors. And it was like a block party where we got to eat, pray, and talk with the people in the community. And it was really nice to hear their personal stories. And the next morning, we got to serve them at the soup kitchen. So it was nice to see familiar faces and know where they come from. So that was my experience. Nadia is going to come and tell a little bit of the negative part. <laughs> <laughs> They all answered, we all answered all these questions, so we just chose different <laughs> So in other words, Nadia has a positive answer too, I just didn't okay. answer them. Share them. <laughs> so some of the negatives of the trip was not knowing what was next. You kind of really just had to roll with what was going on. Um, sometimes there was no way of knowing. A lot of stuff was canceled, and then they put stuff back in, and then it was canceled again, and then you know, you're just, just getting an alright and go somewhere. <laughs> seeing the community um, and just seeing all the homeless people or like people or hearing people's stories that are just like are very hard to hear. And um, another thing is feeling helpless because you can't help everyone and that's just the reality. Um, you, you can try but you know that there will always be someone that is homeless or someone that is hungry or someone that needs clothing or love. So this trip, we actually worked with um, five different organizations, which kept us busy, for sure, and hopping around, like Maya said, and always on the move and having to be really flexible. So we want to tell you a little bit about those five different organizations and um, what we like, what we enjoyed getting to know about them. So I'm going to invite Jenna first. She's going to talk about the root cellar. So the root cellar is in Portland, it's kind of a community center where they provide um, youth and adult services as well as a medical clinic. And while we were there, we volunteered with the kids in the kids club and we got to meet um, the leader of the child and teen ministry, uh, Sean Kenobi. And while we were there, we were able to connect with the kids um, through fun games at Kingdom Park, as well as we got to take the little beach day with the kids and that was really fun. It's really important to, um, when you do missions, that you partner with local organizations that have all the relationships so that you're not coming in and kind of, um, like, the nomenclature actually is to go into a place and set up a bomb, like a, a god bomb. Like, you don't want to do that. You want to go in and, like, work with the people that already, that already work and know all the kids. So it was really great. Sean was a great leader for us there. Um, Amy, come on up and tell us about the Portland Housing Authority. The Portland Housing Authority, also known as PHA, which took me a long time to understand, but by the end of the trip I got it, um, was established in 1943 and provides long-term affordable and rental housing and assistance to over 3,000 low-income families. Over, um, the housing uh, is over 6,500 residents and includes to 10% of the population in Portland. Um, services is the goal of their mission for PHA is to provide that they improve quality of life, they build communities, enhance uh, safety, and promote success for the people we serve and the neighbors in which they reside. Um, we had two projects that we worked with them. We went to a park that had overgrown shrubbery, and we were able to um, make that look much nicer so the kids can play in an area that um, wasn't overgrown. Um, we had power tools, so it was pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of reports power tools. So. Um, and also, we also went to uh, homes, and we were able to uh, um, paint the bottom of the section of the door. And that was also very empowering because I actually had, and many others, had a chance to fellowship with people that were living there. And uh, very rewarding. Yeah, I don't know how many houses we got to that day. It wasn't near as many. Like, on some level, sometimes you think like a trip is about doing lots of, which we did lots and lots. We got all these houses to make the, the, foot, the kickboards, essentially, underneath the door. But then the kick plates, but then we kept meeting the people, right? Like, because there's someone scrubbing and painting your front door without 
you know, so then like this, which is one of the kids, right? Wasn't it your experience? One of the kids that was home was like, look out the screen door. <laughs> and then you'd be like, hi. We're just going to paint the bottom of your door. Is that okay? Okay. You know? <laughs> and then they would go get their mother or whoever, and then, you know, we'd get to talk to them, which was great. Delayed our painting, but it was really what it's about, right? Sometimes the stuff that you do on mission is, um, what is it? One of them calls it, Brian called it a front. Yeah, like the meal is a front sometimes so that you can just develop relationships and love people and listen to their stories. Donna, come up and tell us about Preble Street Resource Center. Short people. I'm not exactly sure we're either going to have that or the multiple level steps. Okay, um, Preble Street Resource Center uh, is a nonprofit organization and it's not only a soup kitchen but it's a food pantry, a shelter, this they offer social work services, housing support to all kinds of all homeless from teens to bad women to veterans and homeless families. And um Purple uh, is a welcoming community where everyone is respected and treated with dignity. They don't look down on anyone, they don't refuse anyone. It is open 24/7, 365 days a week to meet the meet to meet the needs of over 500 people, and uh, all the food and most of the supplies are all donated. Uh, this, uh, the, I don't know Suella's last name. Suella, I don't recall her last name, but she basically runs the kitchen and she is the chef of a high-end restaurant, and she can put together some kind of amazing meals that that I we. We sat down at eight and were absolutely delicious. Even the bologna we're going to hear about later. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah, this is breakfast, uh, lunch, dinner. Um, in talking to Sue Allen, she was extremely knowledgeable in all the facets, not only the food, but everything about the housing, about the, the social work. And uh, she, you know, she was, she gave us a nice inspiring uh, speech after we were exhausted the first time we, we served breakfast and it was a couple of hours straight of running and standing and doing dishes and, and everything. It was really, uh, really awesome. Um, all kinds of people go to their, uh, their shelters uh, from vets with uh, PTSD to just everyone. Um, they have a mission statement that I, I looked up and it's to provide accessible barrier-free services to empower people experiencing problems with homelessness, housing, hunger, and poverty and to advocate for solutions to the problems. So Sue Ellen, when she talks about it, I, I think what I love about her explanation of what's happening or how people find them, the number one reason someone is homeless is because they're mentally ill. I don't know if you guys know that, but her services for mental illness um, in a country are not near good enough to keep people sustained during life. And so chances are if you meet someone who is homeless or who is food insecure even and on the streets, they have some form of mental illness. And, um, and then she also told us about the, um, the amazing opioid crisis that we're in, which you guys know that I'm sure have read about it in the news, but um, last year, in the last 12 months, they have saved 82 people using Narcan. Do you know what that is? It's the drug that saves um, a person from an extreme overdose of an opioid. Um, so they, had, they administered it 82 times last year, which is almost twice a week. And so the crisis is so bad that they have uh, created a system uh, to monitor their bathrooms to see if someone has been in the bathroom long enough and not moving, that someone can um, knock and then if there's no response, go in and help the person. So the crisis is really, we saw it like really extreme. Um, we haven't gotten the neighbors yet, right? We'll get that. I just wanted to add, and you said 500 people, but that's the, that's the, um, the, the shelter of Preble. They serve um, about a thousand to twelve hundred meals a day. Yeah. yeah. And who Barlow clipped, right? You were counting one one morning and served like two hundred and some breakfasts. Yeah. Nadia is gonna tell you about neighbors. So neighbors is um 
held once a week in the city of Portland, and it's where um, a bunch of homeless people and people in poverty just come together and we serve them sandwiches and coffee and water. And um, we just talk to them and hear their stories. And we met um, the coordinator of it, his name is Brian, and he used to have a hundred dollar a day heroin habit. And um, then he talked to us about how he found Jesus and how he um, spreads that love and word to others and helps them through his program and neighbors. And a lot of um, people in our team learned many things about people that were there and their stories. Um, one specific person that we met, I forgot his name, but he is nine days sober. And it's, and it's just wonderful to see that there's hope for him and so many other people. Um, at the end of, um, of the of neighbors, um, they have a prayer circle, and we all get together in a circle, and someone goes in the middle and asks for prayers, and people put their hands on them, and we pray, and it's just very touching. In that moment, I felt the Holy Spirit, and it was just amazing to see. It was very challenging, most of us would say, before we went to the neighbors program, we're scared to death, because <laughs> Although she said we were serving meals, we actually weren't. We just brought meals. But there was no there was no table for us to stand behind to serve people. To the contrary, we were like Brian said, go oh, make friends, it's a big party, right? And so we like had to mingle and be like, Hi, I'm I'm Beth. What's your name? You know? I don't like talking to strangers, no one knows that, but that's, yeah, so all of us were the same. And um, it was scary, but by the end of the night, we were just fascinated that we had met people, and like someone said earlier, the next morning we were assigned to Preble Street Resource Center, and so we had met all these people, knew their names, knew their stories, and then all of a sudden, we were serving our friends um, breakfast, which was just really, really life-changing. So, uh, Lori's gonna come up and talk about Partners for World Health. So on our final day, we had the privilege of working the afternoon at an organization called Partners for World Health. And their goal is to take um, unused medical supplies that hospitals and medical facilities donate and distribute them to third world countries in need. Um, and what I really loved about it is that it started, it was started by a woman named Elizabeth, who's now a retired nurse. But when she was still working, she traveled to Asia and saw in hospitals that they didn't have basic um, equipment like we take for granted here in America. And when she went back home and saw a lot of waste taking place where uh, medical equipment is discarded for various reasons, she started in her garage and just asked the hospitals could she take their, their stuff that they were considering trash and organized it and sent it off to the um, hospital that she had seen in need. And now about 15 years later, they have a gigantic warehouse and several satellite sites. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the day we were there, we really lucked out because um, most of the time it's spent sorting out the equipment, boxing it up, and finding which countries need it. The day we were there, we loaded an entire truck full of equipment that was going to Pakistan. You'll see some pictures of that. So I was very inspired how one woman saw a need and a problem because uh, that could have ended up in landfill, that all those uh, equipment and is helping people throughout the world. There are no, no other organizations like that in the United States. So um, it's really kind of shocking. We have a lot of medical waste, uh, perfectly fine stuff, which is it was really great. To see. Uh, Amy, come tell us a highlight for the week, would you? <laughs> Seconds to go back to the uh, housing authority. I thought I was speaking separately about this gentleman named Anthony Lang. It was two seconds. He was born in Cambodia and he was our support system. He helped us get everything together that we needed. He has uh, three kids and his uh, oldest is 18 and he came here when he was eight years old. And uh, luckily, Lori was very interactive talking to him and we had a very good connection as he was the owner of the restaurant we went out to. For the 15th birthday. Anthony was a refugee from Cambodia. Did you say that? He was a refugee? I did not say that. He was a refugee from Cambodia. So, yes, he was pretty amazing. He was very amazing. And it showed you how he came here and he organized and he gave back. 
Well, so um, at the soup kitchen, they had um, for breakfast that we were serving. They ate all regular foods for breakfast foods. Um, everything from cereal to eggs to potatoes. We had a chance to prepare all that. And, and so a bunch of us were serving one morning. And Lauren was so lucky to get a few items that were unique. Um, the two items were um, fried bologna and a barbecue sauce for breakfast and vegetable pasta. Well, I go to Lauren and I go, wow, that's making me a little nauseous, that smell. And she smiled and said, well, that thing smells lovely. It smells delicious. <laughs> so I went and I said, OK. So I said, oh, as I'm doing my meal or soup, and she's going, oh my, we have breakfast barbecue fried bologna, and we have breakfast vegetable pasta. We're all looking at her like, she sold that like it was the best food ever. I mean, and I'm going like, oh, it's almost gone to smell. It's <laughs> and Beth's going, <laughs> and yeah, Lori is selling it. Like, so if you guys ever need anything to sell for somebody, Lori is the woman. Okay? She can sell that barbecue fried bologna like you. Breakfast, barbecue fried Breakfast bologna. Breakfast bologna. Does someone have Jill's couple sentences to share? Does she send it to anyone? Okay. Uh, biggest challenge. Someone. Out of the blue, who, who, someone named the biggest challenge. Who's got your, who's got your thing? Not even out of the What was your biggest challenge? Is it bad? Someone else. <laughs> <laughs> you just gave me a look like, please don't make me stand out loud. Oh, that's great. Right. That's my answer. I'm, I'm going to tell you what the chills was, right? Her biggest challenge, it was the second night, I think. We were sitting around our table. It was very late. We were exhausted. And um, she said, I don't understand why I. How come I get to live in a house that has four bedrooms and four people? And we met people today who live in a house with three bedrooms and twelve people. And so we have this great part because that's the beginning, that's the beginning sentence of what privilege is, right? Privilege doesn't mean I didn't work for what I have. Of course, we've all worked for things that we have in our life. The difference is your starting point, right? That Jill realized her starting point was not the same as all the kids she met that day. That, that she has she, she has a running start, a really long running start, you know? And that's what privilege is. When people say that on the news, when people say, hey, check your privilege, they're really not being a jerk to you. They're really just reminding all of us we live in houses with four bedrooms and four people, and that there are people who live in houses with three bedrooms and 12 people. And that's the running start that we got over people in the world. And so that was her biggest challenge, to come to grips with her own privilege and be able to face it and be able to talk about it. Slideshow. So we put together a slideshow of you know stuff we people we met and things we did and then we're gonna close out our time um, telling you some of the individual stories that we met and not just about the organization.
the people, um, more more specifics or more personal stuff. So Gabby, you can tell us about Odette. Um, I met this woman Odette at the hub in Gate. Um, she was a refugee from Africa and she's been here 40 years and she is in her early 40s and has uh, two young uh, teenage, teenage daughters and a husband that she hasn't seen for four years. So um, she was talking about, you know, we exchanged life stories, like my story, her story. And it was very um, rewarding to, she was a very positive person and she's hoping that She's in the middle of getting people work together to get her family here, hopefully by next year. So for me it was a little heartbreaker that for four years she has seen her children and her husband. And she's all by herself in the community of refugees, but it's very hard. Uh, when we were neighbors, I'm gonna tell you about Christian and Dee. Um, I a couple different times on a trip, I was around people in wheelchairs for obvious reasons, right? And so there was this uh, guy, looked like maybe in his late 20s, um, named Christian. He's in a wheelchair. And uh, there was a lot of drugs going on the night when we were at neighbors. And so he was not quite with us just yet, kind of taking a nap in his wheelchair. And um, I went over just to pat him on the shoulder, and then another woman, D, came up and said, Hey, Christian, I got you a sandwich. And put a sandwich like in his hand so it wouldn't fall down. And then I said, hey, you know, do you know him? She said, yeah, it's Christian, he'll be okay, you know. And then she tried to get him to wake up, whatever. So uh, I just found myself really drawn to him and uh, praying for him. But then I got to know Dee in the process instead. And so listen to her story. She was formerly incarcerated. Um, she, uh, for selling drugs at her house, she was in prison, or jail, not prison, for 10 and a half months. And she's been out for a year, and she's been living in the shelter, which was across the street from where we had the, park, the block party. So that's a lot of people who live in the shelter. Um, and by the, time, by the end of the night, Christian was awake and uh, rolling around with other people. And so I made a point of going up and saying, you know, I didn't get to meet you earlier, Christian, but Dee introduced us, and uh, it's good to meet you. Jenna, I want to tell that Nicole. Yeah. Um, so Nicole was someone that I met at Neighbors, and her story and herself just really inspired me. Um, she approached our group saying that she needs someone to pray for her friend Tyrell. And um, the night before, Tyrell had overdosed and she had to administer Narcan to him. And then the next morning when he was awake, he asked why did she save him. And she said that since Jesus saved me, it's now my job to save others. And um, after she just told us about her life story and all the hardships that she faced, and um, how she forgave her family who had previously mm -hmm. abused her, and that just showed her faith and her ability to forgive, and that just inspired me. Hey, uh, Uzziah was this adorable little boy. Um, he was born here, and his family was from Sudan. His grandmother brought him to the park while we were playing. And I enjoyed watching Lori speak with her for a long time and, and interact as best as she could with the language barrier. And uh, the big thing about him, he was a miracle child. He basically was born at one pound and a half. Pound and a half. The mother told me it wasn't even the size of her hand, which I had an opportunity to turn the mother for a while. But the main thing about Uzziah is that he was just such an interactive child. He loved to play ball. So wherever any ball went to, he would follow the ball, he would kick the ball, he would catch the ball, but maybe he was doing really well. So the word I taught him was soccer. <laughs> and he went, I said, can you say that? He goes, I said, good job. Now go learn and make lots of money for your family. <laughs> so and he's about three years old now, but as much as he loves to play soccer and the, the ball, it was just so beautiful to watch him and uh, his family. It just was very encouraging. Don. I was drawn to this uh, gentleman who had the ball. And uh, when I started talking to him, he was uh, a veteran. He did have a job. He worked in the fish market. And uh, he t 
told me how he was in the vicinity in Afghanistan where an IED was fired and it had uh, burns on his back and his legs and he got all messed up because of that. So he now has a service dog because he's got PTSD and anxiety problems. At one point, you know, they were praying 